All right, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. Today, I have the honor of talking with Dr. John Pastuch, who is somebody that him and his organization, Active Life Rx, have been following for a while now because the information they put out is, I think, impactful, relevant. And if you listen to what he has to say in this episode, a lot of your maybe preconceived notions or expectations about what it takes to change your life and improve your quality of life and physical freedom, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change a lot about how you view that process. So, Dr. Sean, thank you very much for being on. I appreciate it. Of course, Bronson, it's my pleasure to be here, man. Yeah. So could you just, before we get too much into the meat of the discussion, could you just kind of give everybody a quick intro rundown of what your background is and kind of what you're doing, how you got to where you are now? Sure. I started as a personal trainer in 2005. If mm-hmm. we fast forward, I got to the point that I was, I was a chiropractor who was also owning a CrossFit gym three at my peak. And I had Olympic medalists, professional athletes, a CrossFit Games champions flying out from all over the world to my clinic to see me because I was the guy who wasn't telling people if it hurts, don't do it. Oh, yeah. I, I was the guy who wasn't pulling people out of their sport. And so pretty soon that became their coaches wanting to know why their athletes were flying out to New York to see me, mm-hmm. which turned into developing coaches and helping thousands of people from around the world to get out of pain without going to the doctor or giving up their active life. And then I left clinical practice and my gym ownership in 2018 to pursue doing this full time. And so now uh, there's been many iterations of the education we provide to coaches, but effectively what we're doing now is building the, the professional who I believe effectively bridges the gap and builds an entire adjacent industry to fitness and healthcare. Because the average fitness professional needs a weekend certification to become, yep. you know, legally allowed to serve you and get insurance. Our mentorship for coaches is a thousand hours over thirteen months, mentored by a team member on our staff. We wrote our own eight hundred page textbook. We have eighteen hours of pre recorded video content, nine hundred ninety six test questions, dozens of assignments for them to complete, and that none of that includes our specialties. So coaches go through 13 months with us, over a thousand hours of work yeah. so that they can get the privilege of going through a specialty so that they can work with a very distinct population in a way that no one else is even thinking about doing. That's awesome. So the specialties are longevity, working with aging populations. So that's really tailored for clients over 55 because mm-hmm. uh, their needs are different both in kind and in intensity of yes. regular, you know, people who are younger. We have reaffirmation to an active lifestyle after injury. So the idea that, you know, just ease back into it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's different from the person who is a, you know, a competitive marathoner and like Bert and the person right. who's a weekend warrior. What yeah. does it mean? So we have a, we have an entire specialty to teach people how to do that. Uh, pelvic floor help for men and women. There's a lot of pelvic floor stuff for women in post-pregnancy. There's mm-hmm. nothing really on the market talking about how to handle the male side of that. So we want to build a, a, a curriculum on for that. And then we have, um, what's the fourth one? Oh, neurological and inflammatory disease conditions. So people oh. who are dealing with autoimmune stuff, people who are dealing yeah. with uh, you know, MS, mm-hmm. fertile bowel, all that kind of stuff. They need to be served in a way that is different than a person who doesn't have those things. Yeah. So yeah. we built that extensive education around all four of those topics after the preceding think- general core. Yeah, I think you just gave me uh, four yeah. different reasons to have you back on. Sure. I think we could probably really, I mean, dig into what some of that stuff is just on those topics. That's awesome. I love that. Well, what I would suggest is having the team members on our team who actually wrote and delivered the curriculum. Because my job oh, is I'm to totally say- I'm totally down for that. Yeah. My job is just to say, we need something for these people. Mm-hmm. I'm not the expert in those things. I'm, I'm, I'm exceptional at, at very few things. And one of them is surrounding myself with people who are exceptional and stuff that I'm not good at. Okay. No, that's fantastic. I would love to, let's talk after this because I'd love to actually see if we can set that up. That's, that's, sure. th- those are definitely, I mean, <laughs> populations that people fit in. Um, and it, it, we talked real quick before we started recording about context. And I think being able to split out and define those different contexts and what the information is that applies to those specific scenarios and experiences is a big part of what this is all about. So, sure, uh, you know, one thing that may work for someone else may not work for everyone or vice versa. So, um, 
get digging into those is fantastic. Well, I'll, well, I'll uh, say to give people some some context on on the the core education, the stuff that everybody has to take just to get to the to the specialties. Yeah, the simplest example to understand what we're doing that is kind of worth be different than anybody else. Somebody walks in to see you in your practice. Are, who's your audience? Are you are you typically yeah. talking to the? Uh, no, it's mo- it's general population, mostly Perfect. people over forty. So yeah. so let's so let's say you're somebody over forty. You just had a rotator cuff surgery, and your doc put yep. four anchors into your shoulder. If you think that the coach you're working with understands what that means, you're mistaken. They in general, there are exceptions to every rule, but generally speaking, the person who who is a personal trainer doesn't know the difference between somebody who had surgery and got anchors put in and surgery and didn't get anchors put in and no surgery but got rehab. Somebody right. went through four weeks of rehab, someone went through 14 weeks of rehab. They don't know the difference. It's not taught. And so the number one predictor of future physical therapy is previous physical therapy for the same condition. Yeah. And so we exist to remove that problem for people. That's fantastic. And that's something that, you know, as a trainer, as a coach, you know, I also own a CrossFit gym. I've been uh, CrossFit. No, I sold it right before COVID. Thank God. Um, Yeah. (laughs) uh, So having been through that process, um, you know, I've been in the CrossFit world for over 10 years now. And, you know, one of the things that I realized, it took me a few years to realize was that whole process of there's things that I don't know and I need to make sure that I'm aware of what I don't know and I refer when I reach that line. Yeah. And we, there's not a lot of education about that. There, you know, there's not. And the thing about CrossFit is it's exceptional for the right person at the right time in their life. But the corporate entity tells the marketplace that it's great for everyone. Uh-huh. And then it even creates virtue around serving an audience that is elderly, morbidly obese, who does not fit inside of a group class environment. And then the owners of those businesses are supposed to be able to bring that person in and serve them effectively. They just can't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the the CrossFit community has, fortunately or unfortunately, many you look at it, been exceptional for our business. Yeah. Yeah. Is that so? Uh, that goes kind of goes where I was gonna where our, I was gonna ask is you're in the physical therapy business, um, mostly, and having a background in CrossFit. Which the perception a lot of people I talk to is CrossFit's going to get me hurt. And a lot of the discussion that I have with people is any activity you could, you have the risk of an injury, any activity you have the risk of getting hurt. And my experience at CrossFit is it's often more about the coaches and the program than it is about CrossFit itself. Um, I think I would disagree with you a little bit there. The first yeah. thing is, I want to be clear, what we do is not physical therapy. It's not a medical service. So mm-hmm. we are okay. we are um, adjacent to the medical industry. So someone yep. who is listening to this right now who is dealing with aches, pains, or they're just frustrated, they've been plateauing for a really long time, they're extremely overweight, they don't know where to start, they've been sedentary, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Mm-hmm. If you know there isn't a gym for you to just walk into and get help, even if you were to buy personal training, they can they can come to us. There's no insurance being taken. There's no medical diagnosis being gotcha. given. To yep. Um, but I do believe... Uh, CrossFit, as, as, as because of the nature of it, being extremely repetitive, extremely power-oriented, meaning mm-hmm. the reward is for a higher power help. There is a, a higher risk for injury in, in, in some ways and a mm-hmm. lower risk for injury in others. And I'll, I'll expand on that. Sure. Tendons don't like CrossFit okay. because tendons require an eccentric the, the, the bringing down of the weight if you will like the mm-hmm. lowering of the weight mm-hmm. tendons require that stimulus to stay healthy crossfit all but eliminates that stimulus so i'm not suggesting that if you do crossfit you will end up with tendon pain i'm mm-hmm. suggesting that if you're going to get a tendon issue it's probably going to happen more likely in crossfit than it would in bodybuilding or say running mm-hmm. now okay. if you're look, if, if we're talking about something like an arthritis right? Or joints degeneration. Mm-hmm. I think running and bodybuilding are worse for you than a CrossFit is. Right. And so it's not that you're more likely to get hurt doing CrossFit than you are doing something else. It's that you're more likely to have a very specific type of discomfort or injury during CrossFit yeah, than you are that, doing others. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, everything is going to have, again, everything has a risk 
and the type of activity that you're participating in is going to stimulate your body differently. So the risks where those where those risks are manifested or realized are going to be different. Well, look, when, when, I, yeah. when, when I was still um, seeing clients myself, I was working with Rich Strong. You know, Samantha Briggs was uh, working with my business partner, Brooke mm-hmm. Wells, Jared Stevens, Christine Kohlenbrenner, James Newberry. Like, I mean, the list just goes on. Yeah. And they don't do CrossFit like the average CrossFitter does. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot they, of people don't. A lot of people don't realize that they do a CrossFit workout or two a day, and the rest of their day is spent doing things like bodybuilding, mobility, recovery. They're not growing like they're just CrossFit is a part of what they do. It's not what they do. Yep, yep. And that's how they become the fittest in the world. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's the well, so that brings up a, an interesting question, and this is kind of where I was leading with the the experience is different and the risk level is different based on the coaching in the gym is, you know, when I, I just use myself as an example, when I first started and opened my gym, I was straight up CrossFit based programming. Everything that I learned in level two, that's how I programmed everything. And then after a couple of years, I was, are you familiar with Jason Brown box, box programming? Yeah. yeah. I was with yeah, Jason a few weeks ago on my thing. Yeah. So I worked with Jason. Uh, I, I got his program for a while. I took some of his training courses, learned a lot about the conjugate programming and basing things off of that uh, really changed along with some other things that maybe for another discussion, the, just the whole idea of realizing that, that what we do in the gym has nothing to do with what we do in the gym. It's about real life. So that kind of changed some mentality and of my mentality and how I looked at things, but realizing that performance in the gym was preparation for life, changed the level of how I looked at intensity, changed how I looked at some of the ways that I programmed and did things like that to avoid some of those things that you're talking about, to 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 have some variety in there that allowed for some more realistic expectations and sustainability in the program. So an area that I would love to have a uh, debate, discussion, whatever you want to call it, with people who are into the, the functional training methodologies, the yeah. kanji method cross, whatever you want to do is I think that there's, there are things that we can do that are much more representative of the way that we live than the mm-hmm. exercises that we predominantly see inside of a functional fitness gym CrossFit or otherwise. We, we, we don't need to load a back squat ever. I mean, the, the argument that, that we, the best argument I hear for it is what about getting on and out the toilet and in and out of a chair? Uh, you don't need, no, yeah. You don't need to do a back squat for that, for sure. I don't. I don't see that often, right? People in, in, yeah. in Asia and Europe are squatting to holes in the ground, and they don't use barbells at all. So yep. that's one. You know, things like when I see videos of people, you know, deadlifting a bar and then picking a kid up off the ground to show mm-hmm. the transfer of thing, the transfer of of, of of movement. Those are different movements. You round your spine when you're picking a kid up. You you are asymmetrically loaded. Are you know the, the kid's weight is at chest height. It's more like a goblet mm-hmm. squat than anything else. And we we hardly ever pick things off of the ground in the form of a deadlift. Yeah. Almost nothing we pick off the ground is going to be as high off the ground as a deadlift. Almost nothing we left off of the ground is going to be symmetrically loaded. Almost everything we pick up off of the ground is going to cause us to either round or laterally flex our spine and send our knees out over our toes at the bottom. Mm-hmm. We get into awkward positions. Strongman lifts are actually more representative than powerlifting lifts of real world situations. But then the question becomes how much of it is enough. Right, right. So it sounds for anybody listening, the layperson listening, they're gonna they're gonna hear this and they're gonna say, you know, Coach Brownson is a CrossFit advocate, and mm-hmm. he's got this guy on who's now saying, don't do CrossFit because because it's not representative of function, right? So nope. how do you explain what you're talking? Cause I understand what you're saying, Yeah, but how do you explain that to someone who's hearing you say CrossFit, you should be doing CrossFit? I'm glad you bring that up because you should do CrossFit. <laughs> if you like CrossFit and you feel like you're healthy and you're fit, do CrossFit. I, I think one of the biggest mistakes that people in the health and fitness industry make is putting down methodologies to make their thought process seem higher brow. Like I know better than everybody else. We have enough problems society that we don't need to be infighting about what the best way to exercise is. Thank God. Rather, I'm so glad you said that. Absolutely. It, it's the, the best program you're going to do is the one that you're going to follow consistently. What, what I'm discussing with you is not the merit of CrossFit. Mm-hmm. It works. It's undeniable. Look around. Yep. It, it, it works. 
what I'm debating or, or parsing out and discussing is the rationale for why and the language that's used that justifies the way that things are being done that I believe actually holds the methodology itself back from me Paul. Right. So so I have I have core tenets around what I call practical fitness. And and I believe that for some people it would be better to do practical fitness than it would to be doing CrossFit. And for yeah. other people, it's better to be doing CrossFit than this to be doing practical fitness. It totally depends on what you want to get out of life and what you're yeah. going to consistently do. You know, for Absolutely. me, for me, I, I would suggest that movements to cause a dynamic spotting mm -hmm. should be prioritized over movements that have a static spotting mm, because okay. life is spent using a dynamic spotting. Yeah. Second thing is compound movement should always be prioritized over isolated movements. Okay. Third thing is that we should be moving things unilaterally or asymmetrically more than we do it bilaterally and symmetrically because that's what the real world's got to throw at us. Fourth thing is we should be moving things with a forward trajectory. There's nothing in the world that we do straight up and down. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Even if you like the most, the most straight up and down is putting something on a high shelf. And even that right. we finish forward. Yeah. So I don't see somebody pressing a landmine and pressing a barbell or a dumbbell. But these I are agree things, with that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The, these are I mean, the, the, the most important thing is that there is such thing as strong enough. There is such thing as enough stamina. Because when we start pursuing more of those things in an area that we're already efficient, or excellence. Mm -hmm. and we're chasing mm -hmm. diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. We have to acknowledge that excellence in one domain is indicative of deficiency in another. Oh, yes, very much so. Right? And I'm cool with you being excellent. I worked with world strongman competitors who went to Botswana and competed. I'm all like, from that to Rich Froning to guys who wanted one more year of an MLB contract. You went to an Olympic weightlifter who literally medaled at the Olympics twice. I'm all for however you like to train. <laughs> Let's just be honest about why we do it. That's the biggest key, right? Why are you doing it? What are you actually trying to get out of it? What's the long-term benefit of what you're doing? Yes. And when you when people get stuck in, I'm a CrossFitter, they automatically limit the options of what they could be doing if they were letting themselves look outside that box. Sure. And look, right? I got. I would still be a part of the CrossFit community if I was welcome in it. I'm just not walking in it because I'm the guy who says it could be bad. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. a lot like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen people who will protest politically. And they say things like, America, love it or leave it. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, that's stupid. You know, I love my wife and I help. I try to help make her better. Mm -hmm. I love myself right. and I try to help make myself better. I love yeah. the town I live in and I try to make the town I live in better. Sure. So why would sure. I leave something just because I see an area where it can improve? Yeah, I, 100%. I'm right there with you. But and it was, it's a, wasn't welcome. Yeah, and I, I can see that. And it's funny that when it comes to a lot of things. I, I came up in as a social media influencer uh, over the past several years in the keto carnivore space. And it's been amazing over my journey in that space to see how CrossFit was one of the, in my experience, one of the more vocal communities against the ketogenic diet. And then... Now, slowly, apparently, things are changing there and people are starting to accept it more as they start realizing, hey, wait, this stuff actually works. Mm -hmm. And it's it always amazed me that for the community that is based on a methodology that disrupted the industry, how anti-disruption they are to their own methodology. Well, you shouldn't be surprised by that. Methodology, right? Methodologies are, are inherently house of cards. Yeah choice but to be because when you're a methodology what it what it indicates is everything that we do is built upon the thing that we previously said and proved and so now what happens is if any one of those things that we said and proved it's not proven well then the whole house of cards the whole thing comes down. down right yeah right yeah and so what i what i like to say about active life where people will ask like oh well you guys just different methodology no 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 no, no. we're a mindset Mm -hmm. And the difference between a mindset and the methodology is if you can show me a better way to do something that we're already doing, I've already adopted. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I don't need you to keep convincing me. I don't need you to tell me anything, anything else. I saw it. You were right. I'm going to do that. Not what we did five minutes ago. Because it's looking big picture. It's not looking at that minute thing and there's no claiming it. I haven't identified with that choice. I've right. identified with wanting to do whatever works best in the situation. Perfect. And yeah, and I, I, you use uh, mindset and method. I use concepts, principles, and protocols. 
that's that's my kind of basically the same thing. I tell people like the protocol is a tool, but it's short term. I say marry principles, date protocols. I like that. Right. The protocol is the protocol could last six months, it could last a year, it could last three months, but the, you're going to have to change it at some point. But the look- principles behind why that protocol works Not- are universal and they don't change. Well, so that that I mean, we could end up just living in like a quantum physics realm yeah. if we if we get on this path. But yeah. just to, to make sure I said it, something like CrossFit would yeah. say a principle is the more um, the more for something can the more produced and the more that it resembles life, the more functional that it is. Mm-hmm. I disagree, and so and so now it becomes well. Is this is this the principle that we want to marry? Correct. Or, or do we need to make really good friends with principles? Yeah. And date protocols. Yeah. And constantly be ready to evolve our friend group. I like that. I like that. It's a little bit more distinction because it's about it's about your own perception of of what you're what you're dealing with. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, and that actually brings up one of the things I wanted to talk about in uh, this discussion of principles, there are a lot of different principles. And one of the things I love about your Instagram page specifically is I feel like every day I look at that, there is a principle or a concept or a belief or a myth or something that people believe about fitness that you guys are just blowing out of the water. And I love that. That's one of the things that initially got me to kind of follow uh, the account and see what's out there. And uh, if, if we could kind of segue into some of those things, right? We talk about, I think one of the early ones I talked, I saw a while ago was about um, rolling out isn't doing what you think it's doing, right? Mm-hmm. Or rolling out is useless or something like that. If we could just, there's a handful of those things that I'd like to talk about. Like a lot of people roll out. I used to roll out religiously but then- as a warm up. You know, in between on my my rest days, I'm going to go do some mobility and roll out. <laughs> that was before we can talk about what mobility actually is, because I over the years I learned that mobility wasn't what I thought it was. But okay. talk about rolling out, stretching that whole concept or idea that pe- a lot of people are doing. Is that even is it what they think it is, and is it doing for them what they think it's doing? Well, I don't know what they think it's doing. So I'll share with you yeah. what it's doing. Uh, fall rolling. Let's start there. Mm-hmm. Fall rolling has, has a few general valuable purposes. One is it can help to move blood flow, lymphatic fluid. Because yes. if, if we think about our veins, for people who aren't aware, our veins don't get pumped. Like the blood in our veins does not get pumped by our heart. It gets pumped by our muscles contracting and relaxing. And it's like squeezing uh, a ice pop up to the top or like toothpaste mm-hmm. out of the tube. But inside of our veins, there are valves that are making sure the blood doesn't drip back down. Do you follow me? So yep. a foam roller can reduce our need to do muscle contractions to move that that fluid up and towards the heart because it compresses the veins from bottom to top like squeezing an ice pop up. So if you're foam rolling for the purposes of relieving, for example, muscle, muscle soreness, lactic acid, mm-hmm. things of that nature, always roll towards your heart. Always mm. pin, always pin the soft tissue structure between the full roller and a bone. Rolling your hamstrings, for example, is is almost exclusively a waste of time because you wow. can't and that's, pin it. That, that's funny because that's like literally the most I ever rolled out was my hamstrings. And well, you would do it the most because you're not feeling much from it. You feel like you need to do it yeah. longer. Like you can, your quads are great to roll out. You can mm-hmm. roll your chest. You can roll areas of your back. You can roll uh, parts of your neck, you know, depending on the, the tool that you're using. Generally speaking, uh, Rolling out your hamstring is going to be really difficult to do because of the way the hamstring hangs off the bone. And the difficulty is to pin it between the muscle, I mean, between the, the foam okay. roller and the bone. Does does that help with recovery, with flexibility, with uh, it can those, help with recovery. those types of things? It yeah. can help with recovery and it can help with prep. You just want to do it far enough in advance. Another thing that it does is it it, it signals the nervous system to relax. Uh-huh. Prep sure signals the nervous system to relax. So you want to be careful that you're doing it far enough in advance of your workout and you would fall roll into a dynamic warm up with a range of motion that you're borrowing from the foam rolling, mm-hmm. and then yeah. into strength or your workout to reinforce the range of motion that you're weakened because you're only borrowing. That's those okay. are the best uses for a foam roll. Okay, you just said something that triggered a thought. I've been seeing. Uh, I don't know. I can't give you a specific number. I say <laughs> over the last several months, I've seen a couple different people talking about this idea of. 
you shouldn't need to stretch before a workout if you're getting full range of motion in your workout. Well, it depends on how they're describing stretching. I think yeah. static stretching prior to a workout is a mistake in general. Unless we're talking about three to four hours prior. You know, if you if you watch a professional baseball team go out on the field, those guys will do some static stretching. Yeah. But they're doing it an hour and a half to two hours before game time. And I think it's probably more psychological than anything else. And it feels good. Static stretching is best for post workout. Yep. Or right before that. Dynamic stretching is best for pre workout. The difference would be static stretching is you get into a position, you hold it. Mm-hmm. Dynamic stretching is you touch a position, you get out of it. You touch a position, you get out of it. The best way for someone to understand the reason why static stretching is bad, I hate to use that terminology, but is, is, is less desirable than dynamic stretching pre-workout, is to do a very simple experiment. Bring your arm out to the side if you're watching. It's just like out to the side mm-hmm. here. But if you're not watching, just bring your arm so it's aligned with your collarbone. And ask a friend of yours try and pull it down. Really hold it there. Don't let them pull it down. Yeah. They, if they're strong, heavy, they might be able to do it, but they're going to have to fight for it. Then what I want you to do is pull that arm across your chest, stretch it for about 20 seconds, feel a real good stretch in it, then bring your arm back out to the side and ask mm-hmm. your friend to do it again. There's going to be, you're going to have no resistance to your friend. That's not how you want to be when you're training. Right. So that's that's a really simple example that we used to use at seminars when we traveled around the country to demonstrate the uh, invalidity of static stretching prior to work. Okay. Okay. Can you talk real quick about stretching to prevent injury? Because this is something when I first got started, I used to say all the time, you don't want to pull a hamstring, make sure you stretch. Again, I think I think stretching to prevent injuries is overblown. Mm-hmm. I think I think dynamic warm ups where we're we're touching and ranges of motion and then we're yep. adding more and more and more intensity is going to be a much better way to prevent injury. So a simple warm up yep. should consist of Doing something to get your blood flowing. That can be a, a monostructural movement like a row, a run, a bike, or it could be something athletic that's just of a low intensity, like a skin, mm-hmm. a jog, a high knees. Then you're going to move into something that's a little bit more grinding, a little bit more strength and range of motion oriented. Then we're going to start to work into our our power up. And we start off with low power when we're to high. Yeah. If you follow that cadence, you're, you're, you're no more likely to get hurt than... Uh, is necessary if you will. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember doing that for years and then I was reading an article that was talking about how hamstring, hamstring injuries in sports is really a, a strength issue, not a flexibility issue. Well, maybe that kind of maybe typically, typically hamstring issues in sports, in my experience, have more to do with motor timing mm, than than that, anything else. Because it's most of the time people will strain their hamstring either over striding case of something like a baseball player reaching for first base mm-hmm. or uh, in failing to decelerate. So you don't see okay. people blowing out their hamstrings, pulling your barbell up. You see people sure. blow out their hamstrings, lowering their barbell to the ground and then trying to change direction. It's all about the deceleration and and, and change of inertia that, that damages okay. the muscles. Okay. All right. Yeah. So we're talking about getting hurt. As you know, most of the people listening to this are in their 40s. Some of them have injuries. Some of them are working out and they're afraid they're going to get injuries. What does someone do if you're starting a program and you have an injury already or you're, you've been in a program, you got hurt, but you don't want to stop and you want to keep doing something? What are some tips or guidelines for, for doing that? Step one, call active play. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and that's not a cheap plug because what I, what I, when I say talk to us, we help people all the time who are never going to be clients. Mm. So if you come to our Active Life Rx Instagram account and you ask us a question about what's going on with you, the odds are you're not going to become a client and we're still going to help. So that's, that's, I mean that. The next thing is, it depends on your relationship with your coach and it depends on your, your relationship with your doctors and it depends on your relationship with exercise. Mm-hmm. We have to evaluate why we're doing it. What's the importance of it? Because the risk that we run in blowing through it is, for example, oh, I hurt my 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 knees or my knee, whatever. So now we can't do lower body stuff. So we should I do upper body stuff instead? Well, now we double upper body stuff. Well, we add a quarter as much double of upper body stuff. That leads to what's called an acute workload spike. And that mm. often leads to injuries of the upper body. So it's really important that whoever you're working with understands 
how to accommodate around or through that injury. The other thing is understanding what you're actually feeling. You know, <laughs> we've all laid down on the massage table, had somebody press too hard and we said, oh, that hurts. And right. then they say, oh, well, sorry, do you want me to stop? And what did we all say? We all say, no, nope. that's what I need. Keep, Keep going. Yep. Yep. But in the gym, as soon as we feel something uncomfortable, we assume that we did damage and we have to stop. Not always true. So one of the things that we do whenever we work with clients at Active Life is teach them how to understand the difference between discomfort, which we classify as irritation, which drives adaptation, and pain, Nothing. which is just a negative emotional response mm -hmm. to irritation that's made worse by uncertainty. And injury just, is the decision that you can't do it anymore. Right. Gotcha. Does pain after a workout, discomfort, irritation, um, is that expected? You need that to grow? I, I get that question all the time. Should it, well, Am I supposed to be sore after a workout? Well, so that I want to be... I want to be accurate and specific here. Yeah. It's normal to be sore. It's not necessary to be sore, but it's normal to be sore. It is not normal to be in pain. Mm -hmm. It's common. So yes. it's not, it's, it's not rare and it's on, it's, it's abnormal. It's unnecessary. Oh, if you're in the, the way I tell people to think about pain is this four out of 10 or less. We're okay. Getting better from rep to rep or staying the same. We're okay goes away as soon as you stop, we're okay. Is no worse 24 to 48 hours later? If it's getting worse from rep to rep, stop. Yeah. If it's a five out of 10 or more, if you wake up the next day and you can point to a spot where you're in pain, stop. That's awesome. I got to write that. I'm going to re redo this, get the transcripts and make those some bullets in there. I like that. Um, if um, someone does have to make adjustments or do that work, and they want to go somewhere to get that work done. How do you, how do you, how can you help people evaluate if they have to get physical therapy? If the physical therapy or physical therapist or the clinic that they're going to, the nature of the question, for lack of a better word, for lack of a better word, is, is competent enough to actually help them. I have to cover my ass, the answer to yeah. this question. So yeah. because you asked the question, my answer has to be always see a doctor. Um, in my specific case, I would see a doctor only if uh, the the discomfort was persistent, was mm -hmm. focal, meaning I could point to the area where I was feeling it, mm -hmm. uh, was lasting longer than two weeks, and was either getting worse or unchanged. Okay. Those those or if I felt instability, like there are obvious things, but I'm describing the less obvious things. Obviously, if I'm sure. you know gushing blood, but <laughs> but the, the less obvious things for me are the ones I just described. And then if you, if someone does go to a, a physical therapist, right? Okay, maybe they went to the doctor. The doctor said X, Y, or Z. Choosing a physical therapist. I, when I talk about CrossFit gyms or any gym for that matter, I like to use the analogy of, you know, it's like a bar. You go to a city, there's a bar in every corner. But that doesn't mean you're going to end up going to every bar all the time. You're going to find right. one that you like. You like the people. You like the vibe. You like the bartenders. You like whatever. It's convenient to go to. Is it the same process? for finding a good physical therapy. Office. There are some there are some telltale signs that somebody's probably going to be better for you. Yeah. They're never a sure form. But mm -hmm. there's some problems. One, they also work out. They're not. Two is they don't take your insurance. Mm. Okay. Three is they ask you questions before they start treating you. I mean questions that make you think. Not questions about like where does it hurt? What what kind of pain is it? I'm talking mm -hmm. about what would be, you know, what would make this treatment successful? What are we mm, trying to I, get from this? Have you gotten treatment in the past? Was yeah. it successful? Why or why not? Like those kinds of questions. So that if, if they're indicating that they're trying to get to know you mm -hmm. and what drives you, then you're in a good spot. Okay. That's good. I think that's very helpful. For me, this is going to be a, a personal question for those coaches that are listening or people that are thinking about coaching. Can we go uh, back one step first? Yeah, sure. There's a huge gap between that physical therapist and the coach in your gym. Yes. Just because you don't need to go see the physical therapist does not mean that the coach in your gym knows what to do about it. And I don't know when this is going to air, but by April 25th, we will have a live map of all the people we've developed around the world that they can go to and check it out. To professional that's doctor. awesome. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I actually uh, have an yeah. idea for something I want to talk to you after, about after this. So sure. based on this conversation, I think um, having a resource for clients um, would be <laughs> beneficial to my clients. So 
that's definitely something to talk about. For me as a coach, and this kind of goes into that idea, you know, how can I help my clients move better and stay safe when everything I do is virtual? There is, I have more questions than I do answers for this one. And I'll tell you why. I don't see why anything would be different. So but the first thing I would advise you to do is look at the areas where you're compromising on the service and saying it's because it's virtual. So for example, what kind of a camera are your clients using? Mm-hmm. Well, so, me. yeah, so I have ops because everything I do, most of them, 90% of what I do is group stuff and I have an option and I, you know, I make it available and I tell them, Hey, send in your videos, send me what you're doing. Here's a, here's a, here's a place to upload them, you know, and if you lo- upload something, I'll review it and I'll talk to you about it. Um, but not everybody does that. Well, right? I, I imagine that service is more accessible price-wise than something that would be one-on-one. Yes. There's a, there's going to be a ceiling to what you can do for people when that's the model of the business. And that's okay. It's inherent. The exchange that they're getting is a lesser price. Mm-hmm. And the other side of that is, I think that good, solid programming and self-awareness being built in is is more than most people are going to find in most other places. Yeah. And the benefit is if, if people are self-selecting properly, I should not be coming to that kind of a program in my mind. If my body's made, I'm thinking, Mm -hmm. okay, I'll just work around all of this. If you're a otherwise relatively healthy person, meaning you have 80% range of motion across the board, you don't have pain that's keeping you up at night or that's changing the way that you live day to day. When you go into a workout, you're not having to think about, ah, this hurts, so I can't do that movement. Mm -hmm. Then just being consistent and following your program is going to give them more mobility. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Let's let's end this on if you could give us two or three things, one or two things that people should understand about exercise to get the most out of it when they're doing. It's more important that you do something than you do the right thing. Okay. So you know the person who's going to consistently go for a walk for twenty one minutes a day, and that's all that they do, mm-hmm. it is likely to live a longer, healthier life than the person who does high intensity interval training in spurts for three months on, six months off. Mm, yeah, that's one. So consistency over time will always win. Whatever you mm-hmm. are, whatever you enjoy, and will continue doing. Do that. The other thing is that it's it's in a similar vein, but <laughs> it's not all or nothing. Sometimes seventy percent is a hundred percent. Yes. So there, like, there was a day I have a newborn at home now. And hey, congratulations! Thank you. And I woke up at one thirty in the morning to feed him, and I didn't fall back asleep. But I got out of my workout routine for a week when he was born, and I know that the nature of my life and the way I exist is I function with an inertia. So if I stop working out for two weeks in a row, I have a hard time getting back in. So it was it was the second week. I'm like, I'm gone. And in, 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 a, in a normal world, when I'm working out five days a week, I'm skipping that day. I'm mm-hmm. going to go for a long walk at some point on a break. I didn't have that luxury this time. So I, I, I needed to create the habit again. So I went into the gym. And what I do when I walk in almost every day is I do some kind of a biofeedback test. And the biofeedback test is just a good indicator to me of like, this is where you're at. And a really simple thing I like to do is a, a max effort 500 meter B, cold. So it's brutal. It hurts my lungs, but it's a great way for me to be like, wow, there's something there. There's nothing fine. If I'm pulling in the one forties, <laughs> we're, we're going to get after it. That day. Even if I didn't feel like I should get after it. That day, yeah. My body just proves I'm here for it. That is there. Yeah. Yep. And that day I pulled a two sixteen. I was like, we are not there today. Yeah. We are not close. So I scaled all the weights back that I was planning to do by about 40%. I I went on RPE, the breath mm-hmm. ranges, and I made sure everything I was doing, I could do with nasal breathing all. That's awesome. And, and then that was 100% of what I could give them uh, without risking yeah. injury. You just, you just introduced a concept. I think I can't think of, a, of anyone I've ever heard or talked to that talked about biofeedback in the way you just did. And I really, really, really like that because it gives you something practical and real that I can talk to people about that gets them off their aura rings and their Mm -hmm. HRV. And And by the way, and it's, and it's specific to where they are in that moment, not based on some device that says 
you're ready to go now. Yeah. And and I choose 500 because it's just fun. Sure. But I know by the third pull. You're right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, 100%. I, I don't... I this is going to suck or, okay, I got yeah, this, right? Yeah. I, could, I could go to 100. Yep. I don't have to go to five. I just... There's, there's a mental component of you promised you would go to 500. Right. That I right. that I just left to keep to myself. What is so let's 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 pull this thread for a second. What what are some things, you know, thinking about the fifty year old mom who's got thirty minutes to work out and they're trying to figure out, I'm super stressed, what do I have in me today? If I want to start my day with a similar kind of biofeedback, uh, is it does it have to be something that's super intense like a five hundred meter no, sprint on a railroad? Could, no. Like, what are could, some things that people could use to kind of do that evaluation for themselves. Grab a post-it note and jump as high as you can and stick it to your wall. Oh, nice. Um, you know, you'll, there are days you'd be like, I can't get off the ground. You couldn't sell tissue paper on it. Yeah. Or there are days and I'm like, okay, I'll be basketball. Time. So that's a simple way to do it. Um, you know, going out, doing some high knees. Mm-hmm. Give, yourself, give yourself 20 seconds. How many high yeah. knees can you do? What's your, you know, how fast does it take you to bring your heart rate and your respiration rate back down to normal after you do that? There's anything. I mean, yeah. as, as ridiculous as this is going to sound, um, take a pen or a marker, get a piece of paper, out straight of a line to you, Joe. That's awesome. Yeah. The neurological component. Yeah. And, and look, the, the truth is I don't have empirical data that supports what I just described as being efficacious. None of it. But it makes sense to me, and so yeah. Well, I'm I'm very much, and we, we might need to carry this into a second video. But I'm very much in the evidence based versus science based camp, personally. Well, science is science's purpose is to uh-huh. validate empirical uh, is to validate anecdotal evidence. Right. It's not to get permission. Exactly. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. And and I would never tell somebody this is our surefire way of evaluating whether you're ready or not. I would say I I enjoy taking a, a marker, drawing a line, and seeing if it's straight. And if it's I'm trying to be straight. And if it's completely off, like oh well, okay, there might be some cognitive delay today, and I don't know what it's from, but I'm gonna gonna be less flexed with my exercise. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I I think that's fantastic. I think those are all great practical tips. Man, this has been. Uh, we definitely need to do this again sometime, and um, I don't, would love to have some uh, some of your team on to talk about some of those other specialties down the yeah. road. Um, where can people find you? Find Active Life RX, all the all that stuff. Well, they can find Active Life RX and Active Life RX. Okay. They can they can find me at Dr. Sean Pastuch on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, all the places, same name. Fantastic! I really appreciate you, uh, appreciate you being on. This has been fantastic, and look forward to doing it again sometime. My pleasure, Coach. Anytime.